so here is an article that you wrote uh, for uh, ARIO magazine uh, called John Stuart Mill Socialist. Uh, here's one uh, for Jacobin called Was John Stuart Mill a Socialist? Uh, the one that caught my eye uh, was in Liberal Currents. It was called The Socialist Sympathies mm -hmm. of John Stuart Mill. And um, and as I kind of started to to read this one, I mean, this is this is when I decided, it's like, yeah, this this is something uh, we should really do an episode about. And and you know, and I, I don't know how deep we're going to be able to get into to this uh, tonight, but you know, we'll 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 do another where we we go we go into it more deeply. Uh, but uh, because because it did strike me like I, I guess I'll just I'll just put it like this and and then throw it to you that if. I think a lot of people, uh, if they have at least a passing interest in philosophy, which is very likely if they're watching GTAA, uh, and um, so they, they know like just a smidgen about Mill, you know, basically what they know is he's a utilitarian. He's like the utilitarian mm -hmm. uh, who, you know, if you if you took a intro to ethics or intro to philosophy course in college and you were... Uh, and you were assigned a, a you know a pro utilitarian reading before you were assigned the Bernard Williams Robert Nozick and everybody criticizing utilitarians <laughs> later. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's most likely uh, John Stuart Mill, um, maybe maybe James or Stuart Rachels, but probably John Stuart Mill and um, Peter Singer maybe. But the uh, but uh, but Mill's by far the most likely one. Nobody assigns Bentham, so uh, so it's uh, it's going to be Mill, and so. I think if that is the one sort of piece of information that people have about the guy, then some of the interest of the connections that you're drawing might get lost because mm -hmm. um, things like, okay, we should just do whatever is sort of um, brings about the best consequences. And sure. Lots of people think, you know, myself included, you know, that socialism would bring about better consequences. Uh, so, uh, so fair enough. But, the, but I think, you know, you are drawing some much more interesting connections than that. And there are some ideas here that are of interest to people who, you know, might not be, you know, pure utilitarians that, you know, that there are sort of uh, nuances and riches in, uh, in, in Mill's ideas that, 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 that might, uh, that might lead you to, to miss particularly in terms of, of his view about his view about the sort of importance of individual autonomy and, you know, and how, how socialism, uh, can uh, can tie into that, and I should also say before before I you know finish queuing you up here that um, that I I think this is obviously an ongoing interest of yours. You've written at least those three articles about it that I know about, and uh, I think you've you've kind of talked about writing sometime in the future like a, a book about Mill and and Marx, uh, you know, bringing some of this together. So so you want to kind of um, start us off a little bit with with what mill is about and uh and then um and then get uh then get into uh the uh then then start to get into the connection to to socialism and and his own interest in socialism i mean i think one way of transitioning between the subjects here would just be to say that that uh that dugan line about the parts of your body you know <laughs> that i quoted before you know that the that you that, you know, I don't have, uh, you know, just like my thumb doesn't have rights against me, uh, you, um, uh, your, uh, you know, 16 year old conscript being sent to the Donbass, you know, does, doesn't have rights against the, uh, the, the Russian nation as a, as a whole. And it doesn't matter how much suffering all this causes because, uh, because, you know, spiritual greatness is, is more important than that, uh, is maybe the, the most perfect possible foil to, to, to what Bill is talking about. Cause I mean, it, it is as diametrically opposed as any of you could be. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and I think that's really telling actually. Uh, so I'll just give a little bit of, by way of background of Mill's own transitions, uh, because you're absolutely right that either, uh, that utilitarianism book, uh, or the on Liberty essay, uh, are the two things that you typically be assigned. Yeah, that's true. Part. That's true. Yeah. Um, I came from a bit of a different background. So, you know, when I was in public affairs and policy management, we got on liberty. I'd imagine if you were in philosophy, you'd get utilitarianism, right? But mm -hmm. either way, it doesn't matter. Uh, the reality is that, you know, Mill started off as a fairly conventional follower uh, of classical utilitarianism as established by uh, Jeremy Bentham and his father, James Mill, uh, which meant that he adopted most of the assumptions of uh, the classical political economists, at least initially, uh, about the salience of capitalism. 
Uh, and in fact, you see this reflected in his first book or the first edition of his book, uh, Principles of Political Economy, where he makes a fairly standard argument uh, for a kind of capitalist liberal economy. Right uh, now, what's interesting about Mill, and this actually speaks to the democracy of the soul a bit, uh, is he was not a dogmatic person at all. Uh, I think there are probably some Freudian reasons for this also, because he had a fucking complicated relationship with his dad, which we could talk a bit about if you want. Right. Uh, but initially, actually, it might have looked like he was going to turn in a more reactionary direction because uh, he was deeply influenced by some conservative critics uh, of capitalism and of liberal society, uh, people like um Thomas Carlyle, for example, right, uh, who convinced him that there was something deadening uh, and alienating uh, about contemporary capitalism uh, that liberalism of its own resources didn't seem capable of fixing. Uh, but what's very interesting, uh, as he lays out in his biography, uh, his autobiography, excuse me, is that rather than moving in a conservative direction under the influence of various socialist thinkers like Saint-Simon, uh, and then ultimately under the influence of his future wife, Harriet Taylor Mill, uh, he decided to take a lot of these convictions about liberal capitalism and liberal society being alienating uh, and move in a leftward direction instead. Uh, now, he remained committed to a kind of utilitarianism all the way through to the end of his life. Uh, but by the time you get to On Liberty, he very explicitly redefines uh, utilitarianism as being understood in the broadest possible sense uh, in relation to man as progressive being. Uh, and he makes this argument that one of the most important things for people to do, because it brings them a great deal of happiness, uh, is to engage in what he calls experiments in living. Uh, and of course, this is central to the liberal tradition and the progressive liberal tradition going forward, particularly when it comes to arguments for social freedom uh, from socially conservative mores. But what's fascinating about Mill uh, is that rather like Marx, he connects these arguments for experiments to living to ultimately a socialist economic project where he says that if you do not have the material foundations to engage in these kinds of experiments and you're not able to engage in experiments with others that are solidaristic uh, in form, including in uh, the workplace, then you don't really have uh, a truly emancipated society. So I think that's just where we can begin. Yeah, that's, that, that's really good. I mean, that's the, that, I think that's the exact connection that kind of, um, you know, drew my interest in this in the uh, the first place. Uh, looking at that, um, looking at that article, you know. So, I think uh, that this is, um, you know, this is something you get different versions of in in different, um, you know, liberal thinkers. Uh, John Rawls talks about the importance of people getting their own individual life plans, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, in in Mill's case and particular i mean since it's it is um ultimately utilitarian in a complicated way you know there's this uh this idea that uh that you're that people um you know people lead the best lives you know not by uh not by being uh forced uh by um national tradition of the church or whatever like all the people we were talking about earlier uh want uh, to uh, to live a certain life, but but precisely by 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 having the autonomy to experiment and and figure out what uh, you know what works for them, uh, and um, and and obviously we we can get to and should get to the sort of differences between Mill's um, you know Mill's socialism and like Marx's socialism because because mm -hmm. those are are still going to be a really important differences there, but oh, yeah. uh, I am. But I am interested first in in the the points of contact because uh, because because Mill thinks you know it's precisely because he he wants people to uh, to be able to sort of uh, perfect themselves to sort of you know to sort of figure out you know what's what's going to be the best life you know for them by 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 you know trying out what they want you know without being forced uh, into any particular path. You know, it's it's precisely because of that that he that he's attracted ultimately to socialist economics. Uh, you know, at this point in his life, so uh, you know, I mean, you already touched on this a little bit, but I mean, maybe I thought we could just spend a, a couple of minutes drilling a little bit deeper into that connection. Sure, absolutely. Um, I'd like to say before anything else, though, that uh, Helen McCabe uh, and her book uh, John Stuart Mill Socialist, not subtle title, right? Uh, yeah. Actually, points out that interestingly enough. Uh, Mill seems to have been aware of Marx uh, and actually read a couple of his articles uh, and said nice things about him. Uh, 
he doesn't name him directly, but he refers to the articles and says in a couple of letters, you know, this is good stuff. I tend to agree with it. Uh, you know, it's moving in the right direction. You know, makes a couple of passing comments. Uh, and it's really a shame uh, that we don't have any evidence that he engaged in more mature Marxist works, because I think he would have found them very intriguing. Uh, mm -hmm. Marx, as we all know, uh, had a far more negative appraisal of John Stuart Mill uh, in both although, his kind of liberal although, and although the, forms. Although I think his, uh, his more common target is actually Mill Sr., yeah, I, oh, absolutely. Well, I mean, Mill Senior was a much more generic kind of defender of capitalist political economy. Uh, and the kind of major difference between the two of them uh, is that Marx interprets Mill uh, as arguing that the basic productive relations uh, of capitalism need to remain intact. Uh, however, you can then redistribute uh, the goods that are produced by capitalism through the state, however it is that you want. Uh, and Marx, I think, quite rightly says that there's a serious problem here uh, because if you allow the productive relations that underpin capitalism to be maintained, that's always going to hedge power in favor of the working class, or sorry, the ruling class. Uh, and so they're not going to engage in any kind of redistributive efforts. Uh, right. And I think that's a very good proto critique, if you want, uh, of the welfare state and its limitations. Mm -hmm. However, I would actually argue that sharp as that critique is of redistributive welfareism, uh, it doesn't actually apply to Mill. Uh, I think he just misinterpreted him on this point. Because uh, if you look at the kind of later works of Mill, uh, especially the second edition of the Principles of Political Economy, he actually seems to be aware of this very problem. Uh, and this is why he says, look, what we need isn't just to redistribute downwards, although we do want to do that using the state. What we also need to, is to achieve something like workplace democracy. Uh, and he says what we should gradually transition towards are worker ownership. Uh, what we should gradually transition towards is worker ownership of the means of production, A, because that will provide a countervailing uh, force to capital uh, within liberal societies, and B, because he also thinks that workers are more likely to be egalitarian in the distribution of what they gain uh, in a kind of workplace uh, democracy. Uh, and I suppose C, he thinks that workers will be less alienated under those conditions because then they'll be producing for themselves. They'll be producing solidaristically, unlike uh, in a capitalist workplace where they're essentially being exploited by the boss, right? Uh, now, you could make the argument that the kind of workplace democracy with markets uh, solution that Mill put forward uh, still is insufficient uh, because it allows things like kind of wage labor uh, and competition to continue. On the other hand, uh, I would say that a kind of workplace democracy with markets uh, might be more appealing than the kind of command economies uh, that emerged that were inspired by things like Marxist Leninism. And I also think it's much more likely that we'll be able to advance projects towards workplace democracy uh, than towards something that might be a little bit more experimental than that. And we've seen examples of this before. Uh, the one that's usually pointed to is the Mondragon core, right? So I'm of the belief that it's certainly time to try to give something like Milzian socialism a bit of a try. Yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, I mean, the problem with comparative to Marx there is that uh, Marx never really spells out uh, how he exactly how he thinks that uh, that, that socialism would would work. Uh, there are some sort of tantalizing hints here and there mm -hmm. scattered around, um, you know, critique of the Goethe program, some passages in Capital, even, uh, but nothing that adds up to a very complete uh, picture. And I'm not. Um, I mean, look, I'm I'm very sympathetic to to the idea that um, the kind of socialism that we know how to implement at, at this stage of history, at least, uh, would probably, in in some ways, be closer to um, you know to what you're describing. I mean, there there are plenty of things that have been successfully decommodified, mm -hmm. even in um, you know social democracies that haven't completely transcended capitalism. And that's all to the good, and I want those things to be decommodified and more, uh, much more. But, uh, but you know, I, I think probably in any kind of short-term realistic socialism, uh, you know, we would need some, you know, some market mechanisms uh, that we, we don't entirely know how to do without yet. And uh, I'd, I'd at least like uh, the firms within those to be to be, you know, examples of workplace democracy, like you're talking about mm -hmm. with the Mondragon example. I think maybe the sort of more interesting uh, point of conflict uh, with uh, between Mill and, and Marxism is that my impression is that, you know, when Mill would sort of talk about those ideas about, you know, what, what he might hope the future looks like, 
uh it's much more like well i hope as we sort of get more widespread education and mm-hmm. you know, reform yep. that things will sort of evolve in this direction not so much like this is something that you have to like rest away from people who have power with the current system through through sort of organizing the working class on uh, on the basis of shared material interest and uh uh in the workplace and politically and and all that stuff right i mean there's no um like certainly the, the kind of conception of, of history has been moved forward by, by class struggle. Is it really there in Mill? No, absolutely. Uh, and I think this is something that we can be critical of Mill uh, from a Marxist standpoint of. Uh, I think that Mill had something of an elitist streak uh, that he inherited from his father, uh, amongst others, right? Uh, and he was deeply concerned uh, in this kind of Tocquevillian sense about too much democracy uh, without the people being sufficiently educated uh, to be able to make the right kinds of decisions, right? Uh, now, for his time period, Marx was, or sorry, Mill was pretty democratic. Uh, it's worth noting that in the mid 19th century, uh, when he wrote his important book on representative government, most people were still opposed to universal suffrage. Uh, Mill wasn't just for universal suffrage, but he was also for universal suffrage for men and women, right? Uh, which was extremely unusual at the time. But he does say things like, well, maybe we should give the highly educated a few more votes. Uh, and this also feeds into his support for things like imperialism, for example, where he says it might not be the worst idea in the world to have the more educated or advanced civilizations govern over uh, the less advanced mm-hmm. ones for time, just to kind of elevate them up to this level. So I think we should be extremely critical uh, of the kind of parochialism that one finds in this work, including from a Marxist standpoint, right? Uh, now, saying that, I think that Mill has another side to him, uh, which Mm -hmm. actually anticipates someone like Rawls, which is a better side to him that I'd want to foreground uh, in any kind of conciliation between Mill and Marx. Uh, Because one of the things that he does very successfully in his chapters on socialism uh, is to deconstruct the naturalization uh, of market inequalities. Uh, Because he says, look, a lot of people following very much in this kind of Spencerian line uh, try to argue that the poor are poor because they're idle or lazy uh, or they're less intelligent uh, and the rich are rich because apparently they work 200 times harder uh, than the people who are actually in their factories. Uh, And again, very much in a Rawlsian line, he says, I think that that's ridiculous, right? Uh, Most of the reasons why people rise and fall uh, are due to morally or arbitrary circumstances. Uh, Even putting that aside, he points out, we can think of plenty of rich people uh, who live extremely idle lives and they don't seem to be doing any worse off uh, and many extremely industrious poor people uh, who still live in slums. Uh, and so once you take that all into account, he argues, the kind of moral basis for extreme inequality uh, collapses uh, and it comes to look like nothing more than an argument for a deeply unfair system. Uh, and this is the far less elitist side to him uh, that I think is very much consonant uh, with the kind of structural analysis that's put forward by something like Marxism uh, Mm -hmm. and how exactly to enact a synthesis between these Rawlsian or proto-Rawlsian intuitions uh, and this kind of Marxist structural analysis is something that I'm not exactly sure about yet, but I think it's a fruitful point of contact between them going forward. Yeah. And and so thinking about that point of contact, what what you just said, that like there's this, um, I mean, I think one of the the things that is in terms of sort of normative like motivations for socialist politics that's like the most present in Marx is the idea that class society is bad because it inhibits mm-hmm. human potential. That uh, that the, mm-hmm. if if people have to uh, you know if people have to spend all day um, you know working and following orders uh in order to to meet their basic needs that they they can't do they can't do any of the things that they uh that they would uh you know free freely self-directed activities that they might want to do with their their lives i mean i think of like what mark says in the economic and philosophical manuscripts of 1844 about people having to spend their kind of entire lives you know meeting their material needs and you know any time spent and he has this like kind of lyrical passage where he's sort of going on about all the activities that are sort of bad uh you know because because they're not they're not economic uh that you know that like uh and his point is that these are all the activities that sort of make you human 
that you know that you you get to to spend this time pursuing your own interests and it's it's very much a you know 1840s bohemian student revolutionaries list but i mean it's it's good stuff you know talks about you yep. know f- fencing and going to the theater and you know etc 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 but um and and this does seem like it connects with with the mill point that we were starting to talk about earlier because uh that you know i mean like i i think um Mill, to his credit, realized what a lot of people who like might call themselves classical liberals or whatever who like to quote Mill mm-hmm. didn't realize, don't realize, present tense, which is that like it doesn't really do people very much good to tell them that they can go go forth and engage in all the experiments and living they want if um, if you haven't actually given them a, a way of like making sure they even like have a place to live while they do the experiment. You know, it, it, it's it's a little. It's a little bit like telling, you know, a physics graduate student that as, as long as you can buy your own, uh, you know, a uh, large particle accelerator, you know, you can do all the experiments you want. Absolutely. Uh, and I would say that another point of contact uh, with Marx on this um, theme uh, is that Mill is sometimes criticized uh, as an atomistic individualist, uh, uh-huh. right? Usually by people who haven't read into his work all that deeply. Uh, and they just know a couple passages from On Liberty. You know what I mean? Uh, now, he is very keen uh, to preserve individual autonomy from the tyranny of the majority uh, or from any kind of despotic state power, for example, right? However, uh, one of the themes that he picks up from the socialist tradition uh, is how it is that in an ideal socialist society, our individuality and expressions of our individuality and our yearning for solidarity wouldn't be incompatible with one another. In fact, they would be mutually self-reinforcing. Uh, and what he talks about, and he refers to workplace democracy as a paradigm example of this, uh, is how in a ideal kind of social setting, what you find are people who express their individuality by forming meaningful relations with others uh, to engage in kind of productive ventures. Uh, and through doing this, they both express their individuality, have it affirmed by other people, and can affirm their individuality uh, in turn. Uh, so there's very much this kind of communitarian ethos uh, that he takes from the French Revolution directly, right? Liberty, Egalité, Solidarity. Uh, and he says, what we want is to kind of get all of that melded together. Uh, and how exactly to go about achieving this uh, isn't something that he is fully successful uh, mm-hmm. in, I should say. Uh, he was actually still working on some ideas near the end of his life when he sadly passed away. Uh, but again, um, he points out that Something like San Simonian worker communes, uh, where people engage in productive labor for themselves. They're left time to pursue their own individual efforts, uh, but they see their own accomplishments uh, as being reflected uh, in the improvement of their society and of their workplace as a whole. Uh, That's the kind of thing that he thinks reflects this ideal. Uh, And again, I think it's an idea that's worth exploring. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, most definitely. I mean, I think that, you know, I, I think you can say that, like, look, there are certain respects in which Mill is a liberal in the bad sense. Uh, the, uh, you know, I oh, yeah. liberal liberalism as opposed to radicalism uh, that, um, you know, some of the sort of elitist impulses that you're talking about earlier. Uh, hell, I mean, some of the views about, you know, colonialism that, um, you know, I, I think uh, like, uh are, are bad for sort of more extreme versions of the reasons that contemporary liberal interventionism are bad. Uh, oh, yeah. But, um, but, but there's still, there's, there's still a lot like in sort of Mill's um, exploration of the idea that socialist economics might actually more f- fully fulfill his, his ideas about, um, you know, about uh, individual freedom and, and, you know, how to order society and all that stuff that, are um i think you know even if you think all right there's all that stuff and the sort of lack of a concept of class struggle is the way to get there that you can object to but the uh but that there's still there's still quite a lot there that's that's worth recovering uh by the uh, by the socialist left so i uh, hope you do uh write this uh, this this possible book you were teasing but um well i just want to say three things um, yeah very quickly. There are three reasons I wrote the, these pieces uh, and why I might end up writing this book. Uh, one of them is vulgar, and it's the fact that I just really wanted to piss off the right-wing libertarians, uh, which I did, so mission accomplished on that. Uh, 
The second thing is I just think that there's something genuinely really fascinating about the fact uh, that the two leading think liberal thinkers uh, of both the 19th and the 20th century uh, both identified as socialists, or at least were very close to that in the case of John Rawls. Uh, and that shows a kind of deep elective affinity between the two traditions that hasn't really been explored. And I guess that leads us to the third reason, which is I'm very interested in trying to find a way to combine what I think are the real achievements of liberalism uh, with a more egalitarian uh, and economically democratic uh, kind of social organization. Uh, now, I don't think that Mill offers us a silver bullet to that, uh, but he definitely gives us a couple of resources that we can build upon. So that's what I was trying to tease out with those. You have been watching free public content from Give Them an Argument. To access every single episode of the show, the main show on uh, Monday nights, all of the streams, all of the uh, debate breakdowns, all of the patron exclusive post games on Monday nights, all of the patron exclusive bonus episodes every week, and much, much more, go to patreon.com slash Ben Burgess. I cannot resist ending this with, don't be foolish. <laughs>